Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. This show is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people uh, to check out the archive of, at this date, nearly 290 previous interviews. Go to batgap.com and if you wish you may also support our efforts. There's a donate button there. So, my guest today is Bonnie Greenwell. Um, Bonnie is a non-dual therapist in the lineage of Adyashanti and a transpersonal therapist who has specialized in working with spiritual emergence issues for 30 years. She has published several books and articles related to Kundalini and spiritual awakening. Most recently, The Kundalini Guide and The Awakening Guide. Uh, I'll be linking to the, both of those from um, her page on batgap.com. These are based on assessments and consultations with over 2,000 people over the years and also reflect her own experiences of awakening. She holds a PhD from the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology and founded a counseling and education center in Ashland, Oregon called Shanti River Center where she offers satsang, study groups, workshops, meditation programs and spiritual guidance. She was a founder and organizer of the Kundalini Research Network and has trained therapists and offered seminars in Europe, Australia and the US and currently does assessments by phone and Skype with people in awakening processes from all over the world. With a broad background in Eastern and Western mystical teachings, energy work and psycho-spiritual counseling, she describes her role as being a mentor or a midwife for people going through the spiritual awakening process. Um, and I've read both of Bonnie's books in the last week, The Kundalini Guide, and I'm about three quarters of the way through this one, The Awakening Guide. And um, I really, you know, every week I have a new guest and I generally have to read a book and I don't often get through much or, uh, you know, all of the book, uh, but I really hustled this week because I was enjoying these books so much and I really wanted to make sure I read them all before the next one looms. Um, and I'm, to a certain extent I'm going to use these, the tables of contents in these books as a um, kind of an outline for what we'll talk about during this interview. Um, so, welcome Bonnie. That was a bit of an overly long introduction, but uh, I'm really happy to have you on the show. Thank you, Rick. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I really enjoyed your books is that I really learned a lot. I, I felt like um, a lot of things that I've been experiencing over the years, and I started having Kundalini experiences in 1970, were elucidated by what I read. Uh, and um, I also, but for me they were never unpleasant or traumatic. I always kind of basically understood that something good was happening and kind of enjoyed the thing. But um, they also, it also kind of, one thing I found, I found interesting about reading your books, especially the Kundalini one, is that I think it explains a, the, an understanding of Kundalini and how it enlivens the different energy centers in the body as it progresses can really help you understand a lot what various people are going through. And I imagine this is what you do as a, as a counselor. You know, a lot of times all sorts of things. I mean, you know, people who feel they're totally awakened, people who feel they'll never awaken, people who are, you know, having this, that, or the other sensation or experience and sometimes causing fear. And if you just have some more un better understanding, you can kind of, you know, put these things in a proper context and not let them be stumbling blocks as much as they might be. Would you agree? Yes, in fact, I, I feel one of the most useful things I do is is help people to not feel afraid that uh, it's the fear the fear actually makes the process more difficult if you if you have a context you're putting it in an orientation for yourself that says this is a good thing it's going to help me in the long run um, it's going to help me get to if you're spiritually oriented it's going to help me get to the awakening that i've been seeking and you can have the right relationship with it it's much easier to live with. Uh, it settles down quite a bit usually, and it um, the whole process just becomes more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, because if you're fighting, if if I mean, there are people obviously, and you you mentioned some in your book who began to have Kundalini experiences without having any clue what they were, yes. and probably ran to doctors, and there are probably people in mental hospitals who have. Kundalini awakings and, and thought there was something wrong with them and, and doctors agreed and put them on mm -hmm. drugs and stuck them in, a, in an institution. So what, you know, it's a pretty sad outcome compared to what might have been. I've uh, run into a number of people over the years who were hospitalized, at least briefly. What I found is many times though, um, 
they they have enough awareness uh, that they're able to figure out themselves ways to get out of the hospital. <laughs> they're, they, uh, especially I've found uh, several that um, there was really a, a drug reaction involved where they were using some kind of drugs when they went into this process. And once that wore off mm. and they uh, kind of came back to their own center, they might still have a lot of the phenomena, but they had enough awareness to have enough presence in themselves to know how to handle the doctors and or bring in the right people to help them get out of the hospital. But it leaves a mark because if your initial spiritual awakening, you uh, were treated that way and, and you had that uh, trauma of being hospitalized and put in a ward with a lot of people who are truly very far out of it, uh, it makes you really afraid to let go anymore into your spiritual life. It can take many years to recover from the the, that initial uh, reaction to the experience. Yeah, and we'd probably be getting ahead of ourselves to, to get into this now, but it, it can also be that, you know, you can actually become kind of unglued as a result of a spiritual awakening or kundalini awakening and, and actually need some kind of medical intervention, I should think, because, you know, especially if there isn't much of a foundation or preparedness for it. Yes, you can. It's usually it's temporary. It's not like a permanent unglue, though. It's um, it's more like um, at the most a few weeks, but often just a few hours or a few days mm. of feeling um, disoriented. Because if you've if you've plunged into a sense of your of what you are, and it hasn't much to do with what you thought you were, you can feel extremely disoriented if you're not in any kind of a contextual place, a, a spiritual community or somewhere that has um, that paradigm, the paradigm that, that that might be part of awakening. Yeah. And it can be more than disorienting. I mean, I've, I've been on long meditation courses where a significant percentage of the people on the course were just, you know, thrashing about and, you know, kind of like really making strange animal noises and going through all kinds of crazy, mm -hmm. crazy stuff. And, you know, a, 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 the hotel owner would look in the window at everybody <laughs> doing this and think, oh, my God, what have I got, what have I got going here? Uh, so, yeah, that's yeah. very true. That, and that's very common in the literature. There's there can be stages like that, but they don't last indefinitely. You know, no. you don't you don't walk out of the hotel room and for the next five days you sound like an animal. Right. It's more like <laughs> in that intensity of this energy rushing through your body, almost anything can happen. But then when you come back down, um, you may be shocked and surprised at what you just experienced, but you're not usually going to keep going that way. You, you might always keep for many months or years even have a lot of energy flows. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and you just have to learn to live with that. You have to learn to, to get into a right relationship with it. You know, in India, they uh, think of Kundalini as a goddess, mm -hmm. as, the god, as a goddess Kundalini, and it's really a, a, another version of Shakti. And um, if you, can, if you can think of it that way as somehow your energy field is simply awakening and, and wanting to move through you in order to merge with consciousness or in order to transform consciousness, um, then when you have these unusual energies happening, you don't have to feel like you need to contract or hold them back or uh, worry about them so much. You know, you can just lay down on your bed and let your body shake for 15 minutes or... <laughs> Or whatever it wants to do, yeah. and if you if you cooperate with it that way, I've even met people who can talk to it and say, you know, don't bother me while I'm driving, please. I'll give you time <laughs> when I'm home. You know, so uh, you kind of have to get in right relationship. It's your own life force. Yeah, you're just getting into a new relationship with it. <laughs> when I first started having this stuff, like in 1970, when I was driving an ice cream truck and. And whenever I got settled, my, my head would start to go like this, you know, uh -huh. and there had been other things going on at that time. But, you know, if I pulled up to a stop sign with the ice cream truck, I <laughs> so I had to kind of you know, keep moving. And, right. uh, you know, obviously that phase passed. <laughs> but, they um, do. They all pass. you know, all this stuff can can again, if um, if you didn't know what was going on, you you'd think there was something seriously wrong. That's true. And, uh, and sometimes people do go through the medical route and the doctors can't fi figure out any reason for it. Yeah. So, you know, then if you've done that and, and you know that 
that nobody can find a medical reason that it's really time to turn around and explore what do spiritual teachings have to say about this. Yeah. And the thing you said a minute ago was a nice segue into what probably should have been my first question, you know, Kundalini is a goddess. So the first obvious question in the title of the first chapter of your book is, what is Kundalini? So let's, let's get into that for a while before we unravel it anymore. Well, the way that I look at Kundalini now at this point is that it's, it's the life force. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way the, um, the yogis have described it in the uh, science of yoga is that um, when the, the um, infant is conceived, there, this life force happens and causes the movement of the fetus to be growing into a child. And when the energy field is, is uh, complete, the residual energy coils at the base of the spine, they say three and a half times, and holds the energy field in stasis until we die. And then when we die, the energy unravels and it leaves the body. I think that's one reason, and it's a good model. I, you know, I, I can't say, who can say for sure that these things are absolute truth, but um, it's, how it, it's a model that seems to work well to look at it that way. And so when it, yoga practices have been designed and breathing practices, and I believe also in the Chinese system in Qigong, they've been designed to activate and awaken this, this um, sleeping energy that unravels and then moves through the body and creates many, many changes. It, it starts to transform the personal identifications and the um, patterns in the body. And the yogis say that there's um, a variety of brain centers that we never use. We, we know we use a very small part of the brain. And that sometimes the energy awakens different parts of the brain. And that um, is the reason for some of the cities and some of the uh, phenomena that people experience. It's just this energy is is moving through, it's, it's deconstructing the old person and creating new possibilities, opening one up to a more natural, um, uh, unidentified relationship with life. But it can feel like you're going from 110 to 220 wiring, mm -hmm. and it it's, can be real scary. And if the mind gets real locked in or the body tends to contract and try to hold against it, it will become more difficult to deal with. Also, if there is a lot of trauma in the history, I've found that that makes it much more difficult because what's trying to get released is the old trauma, repressed memories, um, old um, uh, physical contractions, uh, old illnesses and blocked spaces. So you're going to have a lot more, if there's been a lot of alcohol use or drug use, there can be a lot more intense phenomena. It can be much more uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, as it's trying to clear out all of those things. So it could be argued that all forms of life have a life force, cats and dogs mm -hmm. and whatnot. So do cats and dogs have a kundalini also that's coiled at the base of their spine? I would say that anything that's alive has, uh, that this is it's just a word for for the core life force yeah everything everything is but you know it doesn't it doesn't awaken evidently as far as we know anyway in animals there's no way to know that but they're not appearing to act as if it's awakened uh it's uh, it's also it's the energetic aspect of consciousness we are we are vibrational beings everything that's alive is a is a set of molecular structures so it's just the reorganizing of those structures hmm. that when kundalini awakens and the rest when we're not looking at it as the awakening we can say the regular ordinary quality of this life force we call prana or chi uh, some uh, western scientists are calling it bioenergy it's just the energy field this is a little bit of a impractical question but so, some people uh, uh, even on the show i've had sort of debates with people about whether or not animals can get enlightened and um, you know some say they can some say they can't um, I tend to feel like the human nervous system is sophisticated and complex enough to provide that possibility whereas animal nervous systems are not but I don't know other people say I supposedly Ramana Maharshi's cow was enlightened um, and uh, in the Vedic literature, there are stories of bears and, ca and monkeys and crows and whatnot that were supposedly enlightened in, in those bodies. I don't know if you have any comment on that whatsoever, but <laughs> the, the question about whether 
you know, every Kundalini is kind of like basic, the basic force in in all nervous systems, and but probably in the vast majority of cases only awakens in a human nervous system. I guess that would be the question. <laughs> well, of course, there's no way to know that, but uh, I would not. Um, I would not. I would think that many animals they live much more in the present moment mm -hmm. than we human animals do, right. and uh, so we could we could experience that quality of presence in an animal because they're not thinking. They don't have all this intellectual, uh, conceptual stuff going on, as far as we know, that we do. Mm -hmm. If if they did, they'd look a lot more chaotic. Well, they I'm don't sure. have frontal cortexes and. The, more yeah. And so that, that actually could be used as an argument in favor of enlightenment being rather unique to human beings. And, and their brain and nervous system is sophisticated enough to uh, support awareness of universal consciousness. Because enlightenment is more than just living in the now, is it not? I mean, our, my dog lives in the now, but she also attacks the lawnmower thinking it's some kind of enemy or something <laughs> <laughs> well that's that is the difference i mean we humans whoops sorry we humans are capable of knowing in a way knowing what we know um and uh, uh putting it into some sort of a, a framework I and mean, that's what the mind does um but you know to me i i i hesitate even to call humans enlightened at least as um individuals mm -hmm. i'm not sure that we can say that um, a, a personality it doesn't get enlightened, uh, a, a me doesn't get enlightened. What happens is that when everything falls away and there's only the awareness of being the whole or being um, part of the whole, part of everything, connected to everything, in that moment there is enlightenment, there is uh, but as soon as thought comes back into the picture and as soon as we start communicating, we have to use these forms. We have to use our, our humanness. So I think that's why when the Buddha was asked, if, you know, uh, if he was enlightened, he simply said, I'm awake. I think awakeness, humans can function as awakeness, but enlightenment is that um, total loss of, the separateness, the separateness. And I don't think when we go around and we like I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. you and I are, have to be separate in order to communicate. We may know in some part of us that we aren't, that, that, that the source that has enlivened both of us and everybody else and everything else on the planet is all one. But um, when we're communicating, we're living through these uh, apparent separate forms. And we see each other as separate, uh, apparent beings, not, not looking just alike, not dissolving. Enlightened people don't go around not seeing anything as right. evil. Yeah, Vedanta has this phrase, Lesha Vidya, which means faint remains of ignorance, and it's said to be necessary in order to live life. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, yeah. uh, without some recognition or acknowledgement of duality, you couldn't eat or walk through the door or do anything. It would just be you know, homogenous consciousness with, with no differentiation or experience. Uh, but, you know, if we, if we want to use words to meaningfully, then, you know, the word enlightenment is generally assigned to people who have sort of risen to or awakened to a, a unified state in a permanent manner, whether or not they're speaking. You know, Ramana Maharshi, he didn't like sit there and light and then all of a sudden he answers a question and he loses it. He, he had integrated the capacity to interact and perceive and read the newspaper and listen to the radio, which were things he liked to do, uh, mm -hmm. while, while yet, you know, residing in, in pure awareness, wouldn't you say? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, would, I would say that there are many different ways that people define enlightenment, look at it, and it's really important if somebody says, what is enlightenment? You or what? It, it's it's valuable to say how would you define it yeah. before you claim. Well, that's claim kind of it, what we're trying to do here, it. you know. Yeah. I I think that Ramana enlightenment is there, and you can see in in him, for example, when he is responding to a question, or this is true for many teachers, when it's it comes from a spontaneous place, it's not a, 
um, analytic. It's not uh, thinking through the mind and, and foraging through all the things you've learned. It's more of a, an intuitive um, gift in a way yeah. that, uh, that that is enlightened communication. Um, I'm not sure when you're reading the newspaper, you are enlightened. You're just uh, enjoying being human. I think we have these human forms, and and after it, after realization, it, the next opportunity is to to come back into life and say, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to have this body, uh, but let's enjoy it. Let's let's see what it has to experience, what it has yet to experience. I don't see um, awakening as being. Um, Need a need to be permanently feeling not not in the world because no, no. the world is part of it. You yeah, know? yeah. No, I wouldn't suggest that. I wasn't implying that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm suggesting, just for the sake of clarification of our terms, that um, in, enlightenment is a, a valid word to use. Well, and we need to define it, obviously, if we're going to use it. But that you know. Joe Schmo reading the newspaper and Raman Maharshi reading the newspaper are two different I agree. situations. And yeah, I that, agree. you know, something has awakened or developed or however you want to de describe it in someone like him, Ramana, that um, the average person doesn't experience. And regardless of what he's doing, reading the newspaper, going to the bathroom or whatever, there's a kind of a, a, a continuum of presence of, of, of awareness, of vastness, of unboundedness or whatever that is not disrupted by or incompatible with these relative experiences. I think what changes uh, um, profoundly is the perception, is um, that for someone like that, re reading the newspaper or watching the news or whatever, the way of perceiving it and putting it into um, um, just the way of grokking it, we could mm -hmm. say, uh, is different because you're not, it's not filtering through the old conditioned uh, mental patterns and you're not putting it into a right, wrong, this um, let's uh, judge, the judging quality is usually dissolved and the, um, there's more compassion, there's more uh, sense of seeing the whole picture rather than uh, the normal reactive patterns that one might have who hasn't seen a bigger perspective of humanity. Yeah, and we have to ask ourselves why, and your last phrase kind of nailed it, a bigger perspective, but not merely through sort of getting around and, you know, becoming exposed to different cultures or something, but rather by kind of uh, awakening to that which engulfs and incorporates the whole universe, you know, that which contains, yeah. you know, Brahman is said to be the eater of everything. It contains, it's the totality which contains everything and then the knower of Brahman becomes Brahman. So someone like Ramana, you know, having, a, words are, are tricky, but having attained the status of totality, then within that totality, anything can be done. And he obviously was a rather reclusive type, but a more worldly type could be running a business or something. And yet within, you know, still within that greater wholeness that's not disrupted by whatever parts may be churning around uh, within one's experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a different way of moving in the world, isn't it? It's Definitely. like, um, it's like, uh, there's a natural, the natural state moves in the world with compassion and openness and uh, relatedness that's not separating. Mm -hmm. That's more, uh, this is, oh, and this too is mine. Yeah. This too, this too is, uh, is what I am or what is. Um, this too is another form of this uh, mysterious source that... Uh, is manifesting everywhere. Okay, back to Kundalini. Um, <laughs> so, um, you referred to Kundalini as a goddess in Indian thinking, anyway. And I kind of, it's an interesting reference because, you know, if you just think of it as energy, I mean, you can get energy from drinking a Red Bull or a cup of coffee or something. Uh, but what, what we're suggesting here and what so many of the 
points in your book illustrate is that this is not just some kind of raw random energy uh, but it has an intelligence to it and uh, that is kind of beyond our human comprehension but that knows better than we do what needs to take place and what needs to be worked out and so on um, so perhaps you could speak a bit to the intelligent nature of Kundalini well I've always uh, seen Kundalini as the energy of consciousness it's the way that that you could think of it as everything in the subtle body Kundalini is part of the subtle body mm -hmm. and, and the subtle body is everything in you that's in, that doesn't have that's invisible so it's the movement of all the uh, senses the thoughts the emotions everything is in the subtle field and the subtle field is a movement that infuses us as energy and as consciousness and obviously when the body dies it leaves I mean, that's what's missing is the energy and consciousness is gone from it mm -hmm. uh, and it goes just goes back to basic elements so so this energy of consciousness if you think of it as something that actually formed you into a from a fetus into a child from whatever it began that little speck that began into a full form body you have to say you didn't do that yourself something else created that dynamic infused that uh, potential and uh, made you into what you came out to be um, and so that consciousness and that energy they, they're the they're the suchness of life they're the they're the core of human um, form the core of what makes the appearance of form what makes mm -hmm. this energy body and this awareness that comes from us uh, and be able to infuse they're what infuses these apparent physical forms so that it can can live as form so that that the the vastness can bring itself down into the possibility of living as form that's kind of how I've come to see it so why do you think in the average person Kundalini is kind of dormant coiled three and a half times as you say um, presumably by the definition you just gave the energy that animates us that animates all eight billion of us is some kind of little bit of that Kundalini energy just you know uh, mm -hmm. doing its thing but um, why do you think in the vast majority of people the majority of the Kundalini energy the, is, is, is dormant and, and doesn't awaken well from a spiritual perspective I can't answer that I mean that that's like part of the mystery of life mm -hmm. from a, a practical perspective I can say that that we humans uh, have a beginning in the beginning of time had very strong physical needs and then emotional needs and psychological needs and then we developed perspectives in which we uh, became very uh, centered on our personal life and that's just a huge distraction from knowing the truth of what we are mm -hmm. so it's just kind of the way of life we are evidently meant to be human and at least uh, that's what appears to be is these eight billion humans are being humans um, why the universe is creating that we could only uh, make wild speculations and concepts about which we have done in many many ways but um, the essence of simply the being of our presence of our uh, potential to be in touch with the deeper truths is there in everybody but we're just terribly preoccupied with other things and the mind has become stronger and stronger and then the culture comes up with belief structures about how things are and and it's very hard to break out of that that's our conditioning it's our DNA it's our conditioning um, it isn't uh, easy to let go of that even when people are really seeking spiritually they still run into huge barriers about letting go of all of those beliefs and structures and concepts uh, it's it's 
feels like a betrayal of some part of themselves for many people. Um, and it's very scary, like I won't exist, I won't fit in. Um, you know, it's just, um, I, I call it at one point, I think I said this in one of my books, it's an argument between the self with a big S and the small self. Mm. And the small self has been taught to be dominant. And everybody else is dominant from that place. So you just, it's very hard to consider letting go of it. Mm. Would another way of phrasing it be that, you know, there, if we think of spiritual development as a sort of a progressive thing along a scale from very rudimentary levels to very advanced levels that um, the majority of humanity is just at a relatively rudimentary level compared to what's possible and that uh, it would not be appropriate or desirable or uh, for, for Kundalini to be significantly awakened in such people and, and I don't mean to sort of put anybody down here I'm just kind of trying to describe what may be the reality and that um, you know, theoretically, there could be a spiritually advanced society in which fully awakened Kundalini was the norm, but ours does not happen to be one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, and maybe the, well, and, and you know, related to that question, uh, you know, are you seeing a sort of an epidemic of awakening taking place with all the people with whom you interact? Do you think that, you know, if we had had the means of communication 75 years ago that we have today, would we have seen as many people as we now do having kundalini awakenings and spiritual awakenings and all that? Are we kind of shifting as a, as a, as a species into a more mature mode of functioning spiritually? Well, I won't deny there's people that have that perspective, uh, certainly. Um, but um, I don't think we can really know. Also, I think we shouldn't emphasize that everybody needs to awaken kundalini. I think that more importantly it is where real change happens is in a shifting of consciousness. And that can happen with very little kundalini activity. Mm. Some people are just very, very awake, very aware. And they have had energetic phenomena, but, but I think too often people get really focused on let's wake up this kundalini energy. And they're expecting kind of a a new kind of power or capacity or or some amazing thing, uh, great cities. Yeah. And uh, that can happen. It happens in some people. But it's it's more, what's more important, I think, for the world is a shifting of consciousness, of a recognition of the, the unitive quality that we've all come from this one source and we're all um, obligated to, to uh, not obligated, but there's a potential for us to see that in one another and that um, that this source loves uh, diversity. It's obvious it must love diversity because look at it, there's billions of different kinds of bugs yeah. and uh, every single life is different and how it's lived and expressed and what the particular qualities it brings forth. So there's a, what's needed is more of a respect for this uh, potentiality of wholeness in its diversity, mm -hmm. for this uh, vastness in its diversity. And then in that process of seeking oneness or understanding or truth, or some people would call it God, then often the kundalini energy will awaken because the body needs to go through uh, some changes for that uh, to be seen and for it to be um, embodied. And so very often that happens. Um, it's hard to say whether there haven't been, certainly in ancient India, they feel like in the uh, ancient rishis were awakened beings who came up with a lot of the teachings that are in the scriptures that are so beautiful. So we can't say that this is a new phenomena. Uh, you know, possibly Moses was awake and that's what led him to bring about such change in his culture at the time. Uh, so... Uh, you, you know, I don't know. It's hard yeah. to say because the media makes everything so much more available today. Uh, and uh, also we're more open uh, as a society where we're allowed to talk about these things, where thousands of people were burned as witches in just a few hundred years ago. If they even talked about healing, let alone having a perspective of the divine that wasn't uh, in line with what the church uh, wanted them to say. Yeah. 
Yeah, someone um, named Purr, I think it's a Dutch name, sent in a question along the lines of what we just were just discussing. He said, what's the typical relationship between the kundalini process and an awakening process? It seems that there can be a kundalini process without much of an awakening, and an awakening without much of a kundalini process, and sometimes they seem to go together as well. Um, you know, you were talking a minute ago about people who might have done a lot of drugs or alcohol or something having a rougher ride with kundalini than, the, than people who haven't done such things. And in your book you talk about how various spiritual traditions uh, often have a lot of preparatory phases that one goes through so that the, the whole process of awakening will be relatively smooth and um, so that one, one won't sort of be awakened in, in one respect but way underdeveloped in others. And um, I'm just wondering, you, you know, you kind of implied just now that awakening doesn't necessarily involve a kundalini process, but could it be that, you know, awakening of kundalini is part and parcel of awakening or enlightenment as we're describing it, but in some cases it happens so smoothly that it's hardly noticed as such. And, uh, you know, that um, whereas in, in other people all hell breaks loose as they go through all yeah. kinds of difficult uh, you know, transformations. You're right. There's a tremendous range of how it's experienced. And this is recognized in the literature, too. It can be very gentle and like the gentle unraveling and opening. It can be as intense as a geyser, they say, in the literature. And, and it can be anywhere in between. And there's a few people that are probably born with it awakened mm -hmm. or, or in the trauma of being birthed. Um, it's activated. And so it's always been there, so they don't notice much difference um, uh, through their life. And these tend to be people that are actually appear to be very conscious and very um, present too. They're not; uh, they don't go through as much radical change as as the rest of us do that have it happen midlife or whatever. Mm. Um, okay, um, so. looking down your book here, um, you have a lot of very interesting uh, little anecdotes from, from people in your book, you know, who describe the experiences they went through. And uh, let me just skim over the, th let me just read you the subtitles of the first chapter and see if you have any comments on them. And then we'll, we'll go into the second chapter in which we start to get into particular experiences. But um, I'll just read these and see if you want to comment on any of them. I'll read them all and then you can comment. The symbolism of Kundalini, Kundalini is consciousness, initial awakenings, triggers for awakening, and the role of Kundalini in mystical experience. You want to talk about any of that before we go on? <laughs> It's a lot, I know, but... Um, well, I'll say a little bit, uh, just, just for your listeners, about the things that might trigger an awakening. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, spiritual practices can, uh, very, especially if there's a great devotion or a great intensity about um, wanting the truth. The, the most useful thing is to want truth more than you want anything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for some people, it's a seeking of God. Is there a God? It's questioning and longing to know. For others, it's uh, following things like, like Ramana's teachings. What, what am I really? What is this human experience really? Uh, for some, it happens in an accident. They might have been in an automobile accident or they might have been traumatized in a had people who were being beaten who had an activation of it. Um, it seems like sometimes hitting the spine really hard. I've had people who fell off a horse and mm. one woman who hit her spine really hard and she had no spiritual orientation at all before that and uh, all of a sudden was having an amazing range of alternate experiences. Interesting. Um, I've had um, people who just have it happen spontaneously. Uh, one of the people in my first book was a uh, a uh, woman who, as a young nurse, was just laying in bed one night, and she felt like her bed had been electrified. Hmm. And uh, and after that, it, those feelings would run over her. She was walking across campus. She'd have to lay down on the ground. Um, so she had no real reason. Uh, so uh, there's just uh, many different ways that this can happen. The yogis would say that deep devotion can activate it. I've had uh, people that were nuns or priests who have uh, talked to me about it. Um, 
sometimes being in contact, particularly sexually, with somebody who has very active energy will, will trigger it in you. None of these things necessarily will. It seems like there has to be a ripeness, and you may or may not be aware of that ripeness, um, but there has to be an availability somewhere in the energy field uh, for that to happen. Uh, energy practices like breath work, those uh, and uh, Qigong or Tai Chi, well, I don't know about Tai Chi, but Qigong, um, various kinds of uh, martial arts sometimes trigger an awakening. Uh, sometimes these don't go anywhere spiritually because the person's context has associated it with power or with um, health, health, just being more radiantly healthy. And, and so that kind of the ego takes it over and, and uses it in a constructive way, perhaps, or even a, a destructive way if they happen to be into black magic and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so it doesn't necessarily lead to the shifting of consciousness and, and the opening of the heart and all the other things that are needed uh, for uh, spiritual awakening to happen and to be lived. Near-death experience would be another one, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's why I kind of like that kundalini model of the yogis when they say how it's coiled at the base of the spine and holds the system in stasis, because then it makes a lot of sense why some people who are in a near-death experience, it would start to awaken and unravel. Mm. And then, um, then afterwards, they are, they're and in addition to whatever injuries they've sustained, they've got to deal with all the phenomena that arises. And that can be very confusing because they have no idea why it's there and or they don't have a spiritual orientation so it, it often. So it takes a lot of catch up to kind of figure out whether it's part of an illness or it's part of uh, a transformation. Yeah. Um... One thing that came to mind, I'm sure your book talks about this later on, I'll run through it, but uh, I know I've been aware of people who made Awakening the Kundalini kind of a project, you know, a priority, and um, awakened it perhaps prematurely, you know, forced it in some mm -hmm. way, maybe like through a lot mm -hmm. of intense breathing practices or something, and got themselves into trouble. So um, maybe we could, would we agree that the purpose of this interview is not to inspire people to, you know, wait, awaken their kundalini come hell or high water, but we're, we're trying to describe a phenomenon that very often accompanies spiritual awakening, but, um, you know, there, there has to be a more holistic package of, of development in, in the context of which kundalini awakening is going to be part, but, it, you know, if you, if you kind of drive just on that, you might be putting the cart before the horse to throw in several metaphors in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree though. Um, I've found that a lot of people who have really diff great difficulties with it are not only are they working very intensely, but they might be doing multiple things. So they might be doing uh, shaman, shamanic practices one weekend and uh, uh, energy work of some other sort during the week and uh, five hours of meditation a day and fasting and they're just they're just throwing everything at this as if the awakening of the energy was the focus and the function and the, the right. what they wanted often and, without uh, any it can adequate be very, guidance very, yeah often uh, yeah there's everything's available today i mean i run into a lot of people who have had uh, really traumatic energetic processes following things on the internet mm -hmm. and um so everything's available. It used to be all this stuff was secret. You didn't have availability unless you were prepared. Right. But nowadays, and in addition to doing all those things, they may be out getting drunk once a week yeah. or uh, doing something else that's not good for the body, mm -hmm. That's that the toxins are building up at the same time they're doing a practice that's supposed to release toxins. And so they, um, they can have very chaotic, difficult, painful openings if that's what's going on. And uh, I always, I don't really teach people how to awaken Kundalini. Um, I work more with the repair work, you know, with the people that are having difficulties. But um, I, if people ask me, I say, just do a very sincere and deep meditation practice. Just it, the more you long for truth and you go within your deeper self for that, 
um, the closer you're going to come to awakening. And then if Kundalini is supposed to activate, uh, it will. Yeah. And uh, the other thing people can do is a, is a gentle yoga practice or chagoon practice, just one thing at a moderate way. The Buddha liked to talk about moderation. He discovered that after many years, uh, moderation might be a good idea. Um, so it's kind of like, I think that some kind of body work is useful for people who tend to be very contracted, who have a lot of um, resistance in their body, who are a little bit rigid. That can be very helpful in helping them open up. <laughs> It was extremely helpful for me in my own process, was doing some breath work and opening up that way. But somebody that's a little um, already quite open um, or who's had a lot of abuse in their history, that can be very traumatic. You know, you don't really... It's so important to kind of understand yourself and what your genuine needs are yeah. and, and to listen to your body. Um, and not to push through the way the the way we we're taught in our culture to push through everything. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's so important to really listen to what what's the authentic movement for me right now, mm. and um, and what would it mean to really discover uh, truth, you know? And that's going to come. It's not going to. It's going to come below the net. It's not going to come from. Uh, an intellectual pursuit. You, you might use the intellect until you get so frustrated you know you can't find the answer and something breaks open. Mm. But um, it's going to come from resting in the heart and in the presence and in the beingness. And then when if Kundalini activates as you awaken to, to this pure consciousness process, you um, you can have a really positive relationship with it. One thing that's been interesting to me is I, I studied Kundalini for a long time from the yogic model. And I um, really love, I love the yogic model. I love the energy and the meditation practices in yoga. But when I started sitting with Ajashanti, who comes from a Zen Buddhist background, um, I started to see people who were having awakenings without the energy and then going into an energetic process afterwards. And that's really unknown, it's, it's unidentified in the yogic model because they focus so much on the need to get the body ready and, and to do it through the body. It, yoga came out of a belief that people were so materialistic at that time that they couldn't possibly wake up any other way, they had to do it through the body. And so they developed all these uh, physical uh, tools and the breathing practices and all of that in order to help people become available to these shifts in consciousness. But um, uh, the Buddhist model is really quite different. It really kind of downplays the energy. Don't make a big deal out of it if it happens. And uh, focuses more on how, what are ways to shift consciousness mm -hmm. so somebody sees the truth. And um, in Advaita, to some degree, that's what Advaita does too. It relies more on that than the uh, earlier um, yogic traditions. Well, it's it's an ancient tradition, but it kind of got revived uh, uh, by uh, Ramana as a shift of consciousness. So um, it's it's really in a way. So what I've learned is that if somebody can just wake up, maybe they're in a difficult Kundalini process. If the consciousness, if you can find a way to shift consciousness so they recognize the truth of their true nature, uh, the whole kundalini process settles down. Mm. It becomes, it's still there, it'll have phenomena, but it, it just becomes, you know, kind of a background. Yeah. It's not uh, so, so stressful. Well, you know, a couple thoughts are triggered by what you said. One is... Uh, Safety first might be a good motto to live by. Not that one wants to be so conservative that you know you don't have any mm -hmm. kind of intensity to your practice, but you know not to be such a fanatic that you end up blowing your fuses. Uh, yeah. That's one thing. Um, another thing is that your comment about yoga. Um, I think that perhaps the you know fundamental understanding of practices like that is that the body is like an instrument through which 
which we use as a tool of exploration and, and uh, through which we awaken. You know, you, you can't awaken without a body, you need one. And as you said earlier, if you're filling it, filling it full of toxins, it's not going to be a very effective tool. So, you know, ways of purifying the body so that it can more effectively uh, register subtle experiences and that which goes beyond the subtle um, would be beneficial. And Mm -hmm. uh, then a question just came in, but I, I want you to be able to comment on what I just said before I ask that. I'm not sure what your question is. Oh, well, I haven't asked the question yet. I was just commenting <laughs> on what you said, and I wondered if you had any feedback on, on what I just said about, firstly, the safety issue. Oh, being uh, safe. Uh, you know, yes. And you as a therapist probably have had many situations where you've had to help people put a lid on it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and then the issue about the, the, the physiology as an instrument for for awakening. It's like, you know, if you have a, a, a radio and you pull a few tubes out or something, it's not going to work very well. You want the radio to be nicely tuned up and then it gets a clear signal. You know, I really agree uh, that if this can be um, not only more safe, but more um, fulfilling, you know, can move more into bliss when um, there's a positive relationship with the body. And so many people that are spiritual seekers have a difficult relationship with life, with the body. In a way, they're trying to escape life. And um, also, a lot of them take on practices that are extreme, uh, thinking that that's going to be their way out. But the more you respect this as a temple, as a this is the vehicle through which awakening can happen, then you want to make it as balanced as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and you might want to um, really question uh, practices that look extreme. Uh, so that's how you would make it more safe and more fluid. Um, also, I often recommend uh, when people have trauma in their history, particularly sexual trauma or uh, physical abuse, uh, it's so much helpful if they have had therapy before they go through this process mm. because everything that's repressed is going to arise. And if you haven't learned uh, through therapy to witness those uh, difficult parts, wounded parts of yourself and, and do some healing, um, it's much harder to do when you're in the throes of a kundalini process. Yeah. So... If that's in somebody's history and they tell me they never really worked with it and now it's coming up, I often tell them to find a therapist that's really skilled in working with those kinds of issues. And that therapist doesn't really need to understand Kundalini. They just need to help you, uh, in a way, learn to find the witnessing to that and to release what's there and to find a witnessing and a supportive part of yourself to hold yourself through it. So it's it's not just the making it safe through how you treat the body physically, but also psychologically. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if, there's, if there's self-hatred and, and self-judgment, that needs to be resolved. You can't, you're not going to wake up uh, if, you're, if you're carrying those kinds of beliefs about yourself. You have to really begin to question a lot of your um, assumptions about yourself. Mm. And uh, it helps to do that, and in, in, uh, it helps people who have done therapy in their earlier years. It's very helpful. Good. Yeah, good advice. Um, let me read a question that came in from one of the live viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, while doing a TM practice and being barely aware of my body, I suddenly had an explosion of energy at the bottom of my spine. The energy rose about halfway up my spine and was very intense. It was kind of accompanied by bits of my life flashing through my mind and somehow reconfiguring. Once the energy reached about halfway up my spine, it stopped and subsided. Over the next few days, perhaps a couple of weeks, I had back pain that gradually went. This happened about eight or nine months ago. I did have other, exp other experiences of very strong energies uh, previous to this while asleep, but this was the only time it happened while awake, and it was the only time it fitted the traditional description happening from the bottom of the spine. I'm kind of disappointed that these experiences are not happening now and the energy did not rise right up to the top of my body. So it seems like the Kundalini did not awaken correctly in me. Do you have any advice on this? Yes. Um, 
symptoms. It's very common that Kundalini activates but doesn't go all the way through the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, when it if it happens all the way through the body, it can be really... Um, well, I remember Ajashanti talking about that. It, when it went all the way through his body, he really thought it was going to kill him. Mm. So it can be very, very traumatic. He decided to let go, and if it was going to kill him, that was fine. And, and, and then it transformed. But um, So it's most common for the energy to activate. It might move into the sexual chakras. That's a real problem because then one is extremely charged sexually. might move into the belly, into the middle of the body where it starts working, there's a transition between the chakras uh, right at the center of the body, the lower chakras and the higher chakras. Um, so it sounds like he had an awakening, but, it, but as is common, it didn't, it's not complete, it's incomplete. Um, and he just needs to stay in the spiritual practices. And I would probably recommend that he focus more on the heart in his spiritual practice, because that's what, that's probably the next movement. Very often, Kundalini just goes up one chakra at a time. Mm. So it moves, it'll open up one, it'll move to the next, it'll move to the next. Um, that's not wrong. It's not the wrong channel. It's just that it's, it's doing it in a more gradual way. It's taking it easy on you. Mm. Um, so I would say put focus on a, on a heart-opening kind of spiritual practice. Mm. There is a, an advanced technique in the TM world that does involve focusing on the heart, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And this, this leads to a question, which is that um, it, it seems to me, both from my intellectual understanding and my own experience, that Kundalini doesn't awaken 100% in this chakra, then 100% in the next chakra, then 100%. Mm -hmm. it's, it can be no. going on in all seven of them simultaneously, or however many there may be. And the, the, the sort of the, the attention can shift up and down according to what's going on at any given time. So it's not entirely mm -hmm, sequential it's kind of simultaneous is that right yes and sometimes people will have a huge heart opening without the rest of it happening yet or they'll feel a downward flow of energy in the Aurobindo's practices they focus on encouraging a downward flow hmm. which uh, so there's a lot of different um, ways that that different traditions uh, focus uh, and most people will have, as you say, uh, it's not like everything gets, one thing gets completely open and then the next one. It can happen in many, many different ways. And I think this is because we're many different people. You know, we all have huge differences in our conditioning, in our practices, in our personality styles, in our DNA. Uh, there's, there's differences uh, in how we hold thoughts, in how we what we believe in, so uh, in in our some people are very. Uh, if you look at Ayurveda, there's a big difference in uh, the way the whole body is constructed mm -hmm. chemically. So everybody has a different kind of uh, experience, but I can recognize Kundalini usually because it's like looking at a face. No two faces are alike, mm -hmm. but we always recognize that that's a face. And uh, that's how Kundalini is. You get where you can see from the the picture that people give you of their interior experiences that that's more than likely Kundalini awakening. Um, but it might look very different in one person than it does in another. And there's many different stages. It it isn't something that completes. It's very rare that it completes in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, almost unheard of. Yeah, it seems that there would have to be a, a near completion already before it even awoke be, in, order, in order for it to just mm -hmm. zip through all the different, you know, levels and be done with them. Uh, it seems like there's going to be a, a process, perhaps lasting decades, in which greater and greater purification or enlightenment occurs at different levels. You know, that's, it's very true, too, that you can have a profound realization of truth and awakening of energy and you might feel completely free for days or weeks or months and then it'll suddenly shut down it appears like it's shutting down because deeper qualities of unfinished business arise deeper patterns and uh, one of the things that Aja has said that I really like is that um, after a while all the parts of you that are not yet awake want to come to the surface so they can wake up too mm. and and it, that's how it looks and so 
one of the things I'd like to point out for your listeners is that uh, just because that bliss and openness, if you've experienced it, have gone away, doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Right. Uh, that it's a natural part of the process for the the humanness to return in some form or another. The, the, some of the old patterns and beliefs, and um, that there's an opportunity there to wake up something else within you, or for something else in you to sort of percolate until it resolves itself to yeah so it's a very long um, uh, coming and going process for most people and I think you make points in both of your books that um, you know caution people against becoming discouraged if they're having some blissful thing and then it, and then it goes away and mm -hmm. um, you know I've, I've seen people who you know I, I, I can think of one person who who years ago on these early courses in the 70s was having marvelous experiences, getting up in the microphone, talking about her experiences. And a few years ago, I saw her, you know, having gotten arrested for marijuana. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, she's probably my age. But, um, you know, a person can kind of, if, if such experiences are lost. So, yeah, here's a good point we can talk about. And, and that is that, you know, is enlightenment or awakening a flashy, blissful experience? Uh, or is it something more enduring than that, which isn't necessarily flashy at all? And, and therefore, mm -hmm. you know, would you, uh, let's talk about the, the phenomenon of yearning for or clinging to flashy experiences. Well, you've probably heard many people say enlightenment is not an experience right. or awakening is not an experience. And um, my, my sense of it is that Awakening is the knowing in your, in your cellular being that, that you are not the character you thought you were, that you are this pure consciousness that has created everything. Something like that. It's Uno good, can't put it into words, but that's... Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so if that should happen to somebody that that's known, really known in, in your cells, not in your head. It doesn't help much to just have it in your head. Uh, then um, that doesn't go away. You know, it's kind of like knowing I'm a man or a woman. Uh, you, you know, once you figure that out, you don't have to keep reminding yourself. It's just sort of there. If you sit back and you wonder, that's the form you happen to have have at this time it might not be either one but but, but it's not an intellectual point. knowing because intellectual knowing is you know if, if i took my uh you know high school sat test now i'd do a lot worse on on the math section than i did you know back in 1968 or whatever so you're talking about something much more visceral or cellular as you say that uh you're not going to forget as you might forget how to do algebra that's right and the the other aspect of it is that when, when you're feeling it and, and it becomes more accessible to you to, to kind of fall back that, into that, uh, there's tremendous peace and tremendous acceptance of what is in the world. There's no more resistance. Uh, one of the things you could say is there's no more division. And, um, and yet then at, at times, you know, your personality is going to come to the forefront and, and be upset at something going on in the news or the fact that somebody you love has gotten ill, those things will happen. But there's always the knowing underneath that some part of you, irrational as it sounds, is saying it'll all be okay. Mm -hmm. so, so it just becomes a new way, of, again, of perceiving or being in the world. Uh, a lot of times people who have mystical experiences and very dramatic, beautiful experiences, uh, in a way, they're in that they're in that space of awakening for a few moments. They've kind of let go of themselves, and that's what made them available to this experience. And then they go into this high experience, and because the experience is so dramatic, they miss the fact that they, that there was awakening. It's like it's I think of it sometimes like a breezeway. It's like the awakeness is this part of us that's capable of falling into our humanness or falling into this ec ecstatic or vast or wildly informative wisdom or whatever we get from our mystical experiences. But the awakening is this breezeway in between in which everything is still 
especially everything in you, everything, everything you believe you are is totally irrelevant. It's not, it's not important. There's just presence. And once in a while you might fall into an ecstatic uh, mystical experience. Some people are more inclined to that than others. Some people are awake and they don't have mystical experiences. It frustrates them a little bit, maybe. Uh, but other people uh, are much more, it's like those brain centers are open and they're much more uh, available yeah. uh, off and on. But, but any experience is going to pass. And one of the biggest problems of spiritual seekers is they'll have these wonderful experiences and they think that enlightenment has to do with being in that state all the time. And that's just not true. So they keep searching for more experiences and that keeps the spiritual ego going. So it prevents them from coming into this resting place that's more peaceful and more accepting and not always so blissful, but not, non, not difficult either. It has, there's no more in that place, there's no more longing for bliss. It doesn't matter. It's nice if it shows up, but you're not attached to it anymore. Yeah. Just to play devil's advocate a little bit and also to, um, you know, not make en enlightenment or awakening sound like no big deal. Um, you know, I would suggest that it, it is generally accompanied by a profound sense of contentment, well-being, kind of a mother is at home kind of feeling, you might say. Um, just uh, a really nice way to go through your day and through your life, you know, a, a very smooth um, harmonious way of functioning. I mean, the, obviously there can be disruptions and exceptions and whatnot, but this does tend to characterize the experience of people who are solidly awakened. I agree completely. Yeah. It's, it's because there's no, um, what Freud would have called the superego. There's no part of you that's telling you you should be doing things differently, there's something wrong with you, there's something wrong with someone else, blah, blah, blah. That part of the mind, mm -hmm. is it's gone. You can't if it shows up, you just kind of say how silly that is. You don't. You don't have. You're not driven anymore by the uh, the conditioning that's been in your head, um, telling you how you ought to be and should be and and could be. It's you know, just there, present being, yeah. uh, and there's great joy in that. Uh, if you allow yourself, it's great wonder. Yeah. Mystery, joy, yeah, peace. I mean, there's also something intrinsically desirable about pure consciousness. You keep using the word peace, and, and you've thrown in joy a few times. And, I mean, there's, there's a verse in the Vedas, contact with Brahman is infinite joy. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we've heard the phrase sat chit ananda. So, yeah. you know, joy, happiness, bliss, peace, uh, shanti, all these are said to be qualities or characteristics either of pure consciousness or of, of the experience of, of living established in it. Um, so again, I'm just kind of emphasizing these points because we don't want to make it sound like some no big deal, because it is a big deal. I mean, it's a very profound mm -hmm. way in which a person can live and, yes. uh, and, and very fulfilling. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's tremendous, what I found in people who have touched that place, it's, it's just tremendous gratitude. Mm -hmm incredible it's wonder and gratitude that that that's available to you yeah. that that's that's what you really are uh, it's awesome and you know it's like you can't even put it into language yeah good um, so coming back to your book there's a chapter entitled Kundalini phenomena and and you you list seven categories of phenomena. Um, let me know how much you'd like to go through these, but it might be interesting to, to touch upon them each briefly. Um, one is pranic activity or, or kriyas. So that's simply the um, energetic releases. Mm -hmm. uh, when your body starts shaking or jerking, or some people, they might uh, start doing uh, mudras, which are hand movements. Mm -hmm. Or they might uh, wake up at night and they're doing yoga postures and they never even learned yoga. Right. Um, so these are all, Kriya means activity. They're just activities that are coming through the subtle field that are, that are part of the process of releasing and, and uh, making changes in the uh, energetic structure. Would you say uh, fast breathing or, or, you know, there's a kind of a pranayama that's like... Mm -hmm. 
yeah. like that kind of thing can start yes. happening spontaneously. Yes, that's common. That happens a lot in meditation too, even when Kundalini is not awakened. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, that's the prana has to do with the breath. Mm -hmm. It's your breath. So um, they are closely linked into these uh, with these kriyas. And very often there are some people even say they stop breathing for a while. I've heard people say they really were in a panic because their breath stopped for a long time. But um, it's really just part of that whole restructuring that's going on in the energetic field. Yep. Other involuntary energy phenomena, or, or does, what you, does what we said cover it? Well, one of the things people often talk about is huge heat, big heat, rushes yeah. of heat. Or sometimes there'll be heat and then cold afterwards. If you've been running a whole lot of energy, sometimes the body gets really cold later. Hmm. Um, there also can be just strange movements of the hands or the feet, or like you were describing with your neck yeah. uh, when you were driving your ice cream truck. Um, that's a that's an involuntary movement. Mm. Yeah, so those are those are some of the kind. I used to have this funny thing. It hasn't happened much in recent years, but it used to happen like very occasionally, but almost like maybe once a year or something, where all I'd be just doing whatever, riding in the car, and all of a sudden I'd feel like someone stuck a pin in one side of my back, and it was like ah, mm. but it was like nice at the same time. There was something that kind of <laughs> woke up in me as, as a, yeah, yeah, and then it would go away and happen a year later again. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't <laughs> any kind of injury or anything. It was just this weird little energy thing. A lot of people have difficult energies in their head. Mm -hmm. They might feel like bugs are crawling on them, mm. or they're itching, or there's a vibration or an inner sound. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so those are other kinds of phenomena that might arise that shock people because they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what it belongs to. They don't recognize it as part of a, pro a spiritual process. Mm. There could be pleasant stuff in the head too, is like bliss kind of coming, pouring down like honey mm -hmm. over the scalp and things. That's true. Um, physiological problems, another subtitle here. What it seems to me, well, it's really interesting because I've seen two opposite responses. And some people have written to me and claimed they were cured of something. Mm -hmm. One person said they were cured of diabetes. Another one, I don't remember, but there's just different. Once in a while, somebody will say, oh, all this problem, all my back problem went away. I had this terrible back problem. It's gone. Um, and other people, they develop more physical difficulties. Um, my sense is that if there's an area of your body that's vulnerable, either that's a part of you that's always had some difficulties, maybe digestion or the throat, or there's a part of you that um, has had a serious injury, you're more likely to feel activity intensifying around that area. And because it's already vulnerable, it may be more painful. So I think that sometimes when there's a lot of pain, it's, it's the intention or the potential of the energy to fix it. But it can be really difficult going through it uh, while it's working in that area. There was something else that I wanted to say. I can't remember. Well, let me just jog your memory. Um, okay. Another physical difficulty I find, I've observed to be quite common is insomnia. You know, sometimes people oh, get okay. really bad insomnia when they have a lot of Kundalini stuff going on. Uh, let me back up because I just remembered what I wanted to say was sure. a lot of times if you're running a huge amount of energy, there can be hormonal imbalances. Mm -hmm. So people might develop thyroid problems or other kinds of hormonal difficulties. So it's really useful to see a doctor if that's, if that's happening because you still need to balance those hormones. You can't um, just ignore the problem and expect Kundalini to fix it. Yeah. And um, on that note, before you get to insomnia, is, um, is it... I mean, does Kundalini burn up a lot of nutrients in the body or, or something so that it might be good to eat certain foods that are rich in certain qualities or take certain herbs or anything like that? Well, sometimes I recommend people get an Ayurvedic consultation mm -hmm. because uh, Ayurveda is one of the few systems in which they, that very often they recognize what Kundalini is. And Ayurveda is about balancing for your body type, your energies. So if they know uh, that you're out of balance, they, they can recognize you're out of balance in some way. They can recommend a diet and certain foods that will help you come back into balance. So that's a good thing to do if you're having a lot of difficulties in this process. 
Um, it's also useful to really listen, like I said, to yourself. I've had people get an intuitive hit on something they really need um, that really helps them a lot when they follow it. It's most people do give up alcohol, or at least part of the time. And uh, most people, uh, a lot of people feel like they can't eat meat anymore, especially mm. red meat. Um, and sometimes they need protein because they're not getting enough. So uh, sometimes I suggest if you're doing that, if you're, if you're on a, a low protein diet to uh, drink a protein drink in the morning, to mm. use protein powder. And uh, that can make you feel stronger and, and more healthy in general, not feel so exhausted. I've had other people tell me, though, that they kind of, after having been a vegetarian, they started eating meat because they felt like they needed the grounding quality uh -huh. of it. But who knows that maybe there's some non-meat alternatives they could have done. I don't know. Well, you know that I don't see that, that it's a problem to eat meat. Mm -hmm. I don't see that it, you should, should not. There's no should in this. Right. It's again, it's following your own interior um, intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know, I remember one man I worked with who actually came out of TM, um, who was having a lot of difficulties. And he would, uh, every once in a while, just go and have a hamburger and that would ground him. Yeah. But, you know, he didn't eat meat regularly. So you know, we have to find our way through this. Uh, and the more you can tune it into yourself about what you really need, mm -hmm. the more you're really learning that autonomy and the, and the inner authority that will serve you throughout the whole yeah. process. Well, Maharishi himself, who was a vegetarian and generally advocated vegetarianism, would sometimes recommend that somebody eat meat or even smoke a cigar or something if they really <laughs> needed grounding, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to insomnia, but uh, in terms of grounding, I may as well mention there's several other things that are very helpful. Hugging trees, mm -hmm. uh, walking barefoot in sand or rivers, um, baking bread where you're kneading the bread, you're using your hands, you're coming into relationship with, with material things in that way. Um, uh, listening to intense music and dancing like a lion, like an African dance or something. Mm -hmm. Things that get you really connected to earth energies yeah. uh, can help you ground in this process. Well, you know, in Ayurveda, you mentioned Ayurveda, there's, there are these three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha, and, and people can right. become, as it's called, very vata deranged, which means air quality, just... Whew, Right. You know, kind of spacey and, and un, yeah. ungrounded, unbalanced. And so more kapha things, which are more earthy, as we've been discussing, are, are sometimes advocated. And as you say, an Ayurvedic consultant or doctor could prescribe something specific. Yeah, I always often recommend uh, connecting with somebody that has worked with Dr. Ladd, the oh, yeah, Lad, sure. because he really understands Kundalini. When we used to do the uh -huh. Kundalini conferences, he would come and speak. So people that have trained in his system are likely to have some uh, understanding of the uh, Kundalini process. Yeah, he's down in Albuquerque. Which helps. And, right. Uh, my brother-in-law is actually an Ayurvedic consultant, too. He's quite knowledgeable. Oh, Paul, great. Paul Moorhead is his name. Anyway, um, so insomnia. Let's talk about insomnia before oh, we put everybody to sleep. Oh, insomnia is a hard sleep. one. <laughs> I can't, you know, I don't have an easy answer for that. Uh, it seems like the energy becomes more active when we become more relaxed. Mm -hmm. So like if you're trying to go to sleep or you're getting a massage um, or you're meditating, when you're in those kind of quiet places is, is very often when the energy gets more active. Um, I tell people that if they're not sleeping at night, uh, they need to find a way to get caught up on their sleep because the thing that gets people in the most trouble is uh, if they don't sleep for two or three nights, they start to become very fragmented mentally and it can really look like mental illness mm -hmm. and uh, they can end up uh, somebody putting them in a hospital because uh, they're not being rational in how they communicate or anything else and um, so even if you have to use um, I use a, a sleeping sometimes a melatonin mix uh, that's called tranquil sleep it's got something else with it that, and people often don't know you have to take melatonin two hours before bedtime. Mm. And uh, so that uh, it may be that some of these energies also uh, deplete melatonin. I don't know. Or they make the other possibility is if you're meditating a lot, you may not need as much sleep. Yeah. Because that's a very, especially if you're going very deep, it's, it's a 
certainly I can't go to meditation retreats and sleep at all. I end up sitting in my car all night because wow. I don't want to lay awake in a room with a group of people. <laughs> um, so if I'm meditating a lot and I get very wired, I won't, I won't sleep. Mm -hmm. So you might try exploring what time of day you need to meditate and also staying away from all electronics for two or three hours before bedtime. Um, they say having a really dark room. Um, and, you know, if your body wants to get up and meditate or do something else rather than sleep, try it and see what happens. Follow yeah. the... There's a lot of tricks to try to overcome insomnia. Mm. Um, but I, um, it's a challenge in this process. I interviewed a guy a few months ago called, named Sat Shri, who's, I, 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 in my opinion, very highly awakened. He said he doesn't sleep at all anymore. He doesn't even have a bed in his room. He just has a chair, and he'll just kind of sit in the chair and maybe go into samadhi at night for a few hours or something, but he's completely overcome the need for sleep. Um, I've heard that in, in a few people, not people I've worked with, because most of us Westerners are not going to be able to be in samadhi for yeah. six hours. But, um, but I've heard of other people like that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. So um, we've talked about physiological problems. We've, we've touched upon psychological and emotional upheavals. Is there anything more you want to say about that? Uh, sometimes th there can be um, huge movements of emotion that you don't even know why they're there. They're mm -hmm. not personally connected. It might be a sense of... Well, I remember once I went through a period where I had this quality of neediness, hmm. just, just which wasn't familiar to me at all. I had no idea what it was. But it went on for two or three days, and um, so I finally I I laid down on a couch, and and I just surrendered to it. I said, "Okay, God, if you need me to experience this, I completely accept it. I'll just feel it." And I felt like somebody like there was a heavy blanket over me, mm -hmm. a quilt, and that somebody took it and just rolled it off of me, mm -hmm. and the energy went away and never came back. Interesting. Um, so sometimes people go through uh, grief, um, anger. Uh, Irina Tweedy in her book, she speaks at one point of becoming enraged because there's a mouse in her room hmm. and losing all control with her anger. So it, sometimes these things just move through you. It's sort of like you have to learn how to stand there and just let those waves of energy move by yeah. without uh, trying to psychoanalyze them. They may not belong to you. They may belong to the something in the universal collective. They may belong to something in your another life. Who knows? Um, but it's sort of like letting it, or they may belong to somebody you were hanging out with that you picked it up. Hmm. Um, that brings me to another point. A lot of people become really sensitive to other people's energy. Their space, their energy field becomes so open. And you really need to pay attention to that. If when you go into a, a box store, a big box store, you start to feel overwhelmed, don't go into the stores anymore. Mm. Um, or certain people maybe that you used to go out and drink with or party with and you just feel rotten in that environment now. It's like, it's very hard because these may be people you really care about, but you have to listen to yourself. Well, what do I need? And your body's gonna react. It's gonna tell you where you don't belong. Yeah. and what isn't working for you, and who's toxic for you. And uh, a lot of people think, well, I'm, I'm so spiritual, I should love everybody, I should be okay everywhere. And that isn't really the truth of what happens, at least through the process. You may reach that point someday, I don't know. Uh, but uh, you have to listen to your own um, energy and what it's trying to say is right for you. Yeah, most spiritual literature makes actually quite a big fuss about keeping the right company, you know, hang, hanging out with people who are like-minded and on, on a spiritual path. Not that you don't go home for Thanksgiving or <laughs> anything like that, yeah. but just that, um, you know, if you've been hanging out in bars and you've decided to, you know, embark on spiritual quests, then maybe you need a new set of friends. Yeah. yeah. Here's a question that just came in from one of the live listeners. Um, what do you suggest for people who develop hypersensitivity to sound, light, or smell? It can be quite difficult when living in a city. Oh, yes. Probably you're going to have to move. <laughs> uh, the uh, senses can become very acute. That might not be a permanent situation. It's usually a, a passage. 
but uh, your senses can be highly acute. So I would look for a place that feels really um, nurturing for you, you know, and it may be a place in the park or in a museum or in a church or create a place in your home or your yard that just feels energetically um, balanced and harmonious. Mm -hmm. Uh, put something you love to look at in every room of your house. One category of stuff we haven't talked about too much uh, that can result from Kundalini awakenings or that can occur on the spiritual path is what we might call um, parapsychological experiences or en extrasensory uh, ESP types <laughs> experiences. You want to touch upon that? I find in a, a certain number of people uh, do experience that. It's not particularly common. It's not, I would say, maybe 20% of mm -hmm. people. Uh, you know, again, back to the idea that the brain has all these channels or, op or aspects that haven't been opened. Mm -hmm. uh, the yogis would say there's certain aspects of the brain, certain brain centers that are responsible for paranormal or parapsychological experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sometimes those get activated in the kundalini process. Mm -hmm. And one may experience it for a while and then it goes away or it could be more permanent. But usually there's a, um, so some of these experiences might be, um, well, having a vision that might happen occasionally or seeing a, a loved one that's deceased or uh, sometimes people feel like there's entities and they see, well, you had someone on your program not too long ago that sees angels and sees the energetics in the body. Right. So that would suggest to me that she has that particular brain center open. Mm -hmm. you, some people are born with that open, so you don't have to activate Kundalini to, be, to have those capacities. Um, but when you do activate Kundalini, you might possibly go through a stage where you do have that happening. Um, a lot of times there's an intuitive thing that will pop up. Uh, one woman was driving her car and, and uh, going to work, and she had a, uh, something in her head that kept saying, you have to go to your father's house, and she kept arguing with it. And finally she turned around and went to her father's house, and he had just had a stroke. Mm -hmm. So she was able to get him to the hospital. So yeah, it there seems was a story like on the news just the other night similar to that. There was a woman, she was driving along, and she, she suddenly had this you know, voice almost is urged. She had to go and to her home and see her, see what was happening with her husband. And and she she you know she ignored it for a little while. Finally, it was just so persistent. She went, and her husband had been working on his truck, and the, and it had slipped off the jack and broken seven of his ribs and had him pinned under, and he would have died. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and she just felt this calling to go there. <laughs> yeah, I that happens. It can happen. In some people, it just happens. In fact, in most of us, it probably happens occasionally. Mm -hmm. So, but you just see it a little more uh, consistently in a certain percentage of people that mm -hmm. have awakened Kundalini. Um, I've heard many other stories, like um, some people can't deal with electronics. Uh, <laughs> one man told me if he walked under a street light, it went out. Mm. Um, so, and in uh, there's been work done with NDEs that suggests that sometimes you're it's like your electrical wiring is different. And uh, some people that have had NDEs have this experience, have these unusual experiences too. They can't wear watches, they die. If they're wearing a watch, it dies. Uh, their computers won't work, things like that. And I don't think that's very common, but, but I have seen it in a, mm. s a small percentage of people. <laughs> I, yeah, I actually went through a phase where I would come into a room and things would break. But uh -huh. fortunately, I was kind of good at fixing them too. So, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was on—I've been on long courses where, like, real strange phenomenon, like glass doors would shatter, and mm. like you said, yeah. people's watches would break, and and all kinds of strange things because there's just so much energy, and mm -hmm. it was having these weird effects. But I guess maybe should we conclude here that you know, don't necessarily don't assume that this stuff is necessarily uh, an essential criterion of spiritual awakening and so don't again don't strive for it don't make a big deal of it you know it may or may mm -hmm. not happen right yeah yeah and and it may not last either right <laughs> <laughs> so it may just be you know something's being tweaked for a while energetically and then it passes and you shouldn't get it all the scriptures suggest don't get attached to any of these kinds of things yeah. because it'll derail you it's it's another 
place where the mind can get fascinated and and then the opportunity for a full realization of truth doesn't happen. So this brings up an interesting question which you may or may not have an opinion on. Um, someone had sent in a question related to your interview earlier on about physical teachers versus non-physical teachers. I've interviewed a number of people who haven't had a physical teacher but have had sort of teachers on subtle levels. Kristen Kirk was one and there have been others who mm -hmm. s commune with beings that ex reside yeah. on subtle, le subtle levels. The Yoga Sutras actually warns against this, uh, but there could be exceptions to that warning. Um, so, and you know, the people, some people have been burned by physical teachers as well, you know, sexual abuse and stuff. So, do you, in your experience, in your understanding, and perhaps relating all this to Kundalini, um, how necessary is it to have a, an actual human teacher? versus relying upon subtler sources of wisdom that may reside in the universe and, and open themselves to our, our cognition? Well, that's a big question. Um, I've, I've met people who have had uh, encounters with spiritual teachers on another plane and um, who have been guided and helped a great deal in a crisis with that type of teacher. One friend of mine uh, had an experience when she was young uh, with a teacher who came to her and helped her through a really serious crisis. And she was walking down the street a few weeks later and saw his picture in a window because she didn't know who he was. And he was living. He was in India. And so she went to India and became his student. Mm. Um, other people, oh, I always felt a great uh, connection with Yogananda, mm -hmm. but not necessarily with his organization. And I've met other people that say that too. Uh, many people feel that connection with Ramana. Um, I think that a teacher, a teacher on this plane is very helpful because they're more likely to kind of call you on your stuff or, or give you, uh, well, for me, I'll say, Meeting, meeting Ajashanti was extremely important yeah. because he was so ordinary, uh, because he was the first teacher I had met who really uh, showed me that I could be an ordinary person and awake at the same time, because I had sat with another dozen gurus and, you know, Amachi and Anandama and, not Anandama, but um, what's Mother, her name? Mother Mira. Mother Mira. And... Um, I had met Muktananda and other teachers here and there, and I didn't want to be like any of them. It was like, I mean, I live a very ordinary life. You couldn't life. be if you I've wanted got, to. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just not me. And um, I married and I have kids and grandchildren. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to dress up that way and be spiritual every minute. It's just not going to be who I am. And he showed me that uh, life is, can be full and ordinary and extraordinary at the same time. Yeah. So I think a teacher, the right teacher for you can be a real gift. And, uh, but so many teachers have been problematic for people and probably caused them a lot of damage because they have used them in ways that were inappropriate. Yeah. So, well, that's one but thing on the I other love hand, about just because, just because a being is disembodied doesn't mean it's wiser than you. Uh -huh. And that's something to keep in mind, too. Yeah, a friend of mine once said, just because you're dead doesn't mean you're smart. Right. Um, <laughs> one thing I've always enjoyed about Adya, and I haven't had a close relationship with him, but I've interviewed him a couple of times now and listened to a lot of his, his stuff, is that um, he is so down to earth and unassuming, you know? I mean, what you see is what you get. Um, and... Uh, you know, he doesn't, like, try to put on any kind of airs or anything. And he's you know, talks about his problems if he's had them, health problems or, you know, various things he's gone through. Um, so it does make it, uh, awakening more accessible, as you say. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I do know many people who ha have associated with one or another of the teachers you mentioned and other such teachers, which I w I'm not discouraging people from doing. I think it can be wonderful to go visit those those types of teachers and even have a close association with them if that's your inclination. But one shouldn't assume that enlightenment is going to look like them, you know? Yes. Um, it, it can look like you. <laughs> and, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, as Aja likes to say, God can do it any way it wants. Right, right. <laughs> 
and uh, so there's room for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing it, that comes up a lot, and we haven't talked about it too much, is um, fear. Various. Well, we could kind of summarize a lot of your points here in, in one general category. There's the dark night thing where we go into something really uncomfortable and unpleasant, and then there's psychological reactions to change and the body feeling threatened, and then there's also fear, and a lot of people seem to have to cross a, a kind of a sound barrier of fear uh, in order to get to uh, the other side, and some recoil from that sound barrier, you know, back off, like, whoa, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, what would you say with re regard to that point? You know, I always uh, loved a quote of uh, the mother who was worked closely with Aurobindo, mm -hmm. And then she said, uh, the heartfelt release of fear is the most significant thing on the spiritual, to do on the spiritual path, mm. something like that. And uh, I think that fear is a barrier and fear belongs to the mind and it belongs to the separate self. Mm -hmm. And it's natural. It it's, uh, feels a sense of its own diminishing or diminishing or even um, abolishment. It feels like I won't be, I won't matter anymore. I don't belong anymore. And I also think it needs to be respected. I think that a person is going to go through periods like that before there's a ripeness and a readiness to let it go. Mm. And so when you're, when you feel fear, it's sort of like meeting it, just meeting it and, um, and giving yourself support like it's okay that there's fear here, it's just an energy, really helps. I also like to tell people, to the extent you can transfer the energetics of fear into curiosity, you'll, it'll work a lot better. Hmm. Everything will work a lot better. So if your body's doing weird things and you start to feel afraid, just get curious. What is this? This is really strange. Of course it is. You know, it's like, yeah, it is. It's really strange. I wonder where it's going. I wonder why it's doing this. Mm. But without that uh, contraction of fear, um, see, that's one thing people can do. But, but there'll be a point of before letting go in a way that, that everything in you is going to try to come up with reasons why you shouldn't. Yeah. Because you've been functioning a certain way your whole life. You, everybody else seems to function that way. And you, it, you're going into the unknown. Huh. And you're going to have to live in the unknown. And what mind wants to do that? Yeah. You know, we spend our whole life trying to figure things out so we don't have to be unprepared for anything. <laughs> and uh, so that's what's happening. Okay. A couple of quotes come to mind. One is from FDR's second inaugural, you know, the famous line, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And... Uh, Others from Star, Star Wars, uh, Luke Skywalker, kind of in a cocky way, says, I'm not afraid. And Yoda says, you will be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question that just came in. Someone said, I had the complimentary experience to the earlier questioner. It started in the middle of my spine and went to the base of my skull. Well, this person picked up where the other one left off. <laughs> he said, I thought it was going to pierce something there, but it did not. It subsided. I also get downward energy, downward energy sprinkles. I like that phrase. I've, mm -hmm. I've experienced that when I'm in a religious setting, such as a temple. My question is, is the second phenomenon, the sprinkles, uh, kundalini? And why did it not arise from the base of my spine? Or how can I get it to do that? Hmm. Wow. I think that when kundalini has been active or when someone's very open spiritually, they can be very receptive to the energy in sacred places. Mm -hmm. So, or even to be even around someone else whose energy is activated, your own body will respond in some way. So, I would expect that what he's experiencing or she in a temple is a is like an it's like the the prana in your own body is is happy to be experienced, it's feeling, it's responding to something in the energetic field that you're in. Mm. Um, I think there's also wants, a, a live, there can be an experience of bliss, I think, when energy begins to flow through channels 
through which it did not previously flow. Absolutely. You know, yeah. the nadis that we have in our system, okay. if you use that system of thinking that, that you know, th something, it's like, you know, when your foot is asleep or your leg is asleep and then it, it w starts to wake up, you get all these tingles. So in, in a similar way, it's like if you have these energetic channels in your body and there's said to be 92,000 of them that have been sort of deadened and clogged, then when they begin to clear and wake mm -hmm. up, there can be this sort of thrill of bliss as, as they begin Absolutely. to get enlivened. I, I completely agree. You, you'll, you can even feel, I remember once one of my arms went into bliss. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was yeah. totally irrational, you know, but, but it's, yeah, I agree with you. The nadis, the nadis come out from the chakras in all different areas of the body. And I've heard 72,000. Oh, and, maybe you're uh, right. I, I was thinking 92, probably 72. And if you think about it, that's, you're, we're an energy grid. Right. And as different parts that were blocked open up, we, the energy responds and it really feels very blissful, yeah. usually. Um, and then you become I, accustomed I to it after a while, so it's not going to always be tingling and you know, yeah. throbbing, but yeah. the, you know, the initial rush of, of the energy into those, blocked into those previously blocked channels as they open can be quite ecstatic. Yeah, absolutely. Even uh, when you're getting other kinds of energy flows, if you can totally release into them, they can turn into bliss. Mm -hmm. um, if you can just completely relax into being that energy mm -hmm. flow. And then the jerking and the shaking can become very blissful. Yeah. And afterwards, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems, I'm not sure what to say about uh, opening it from the lower chakra after you already feel, have felt some opening at the uh, center of the body. Um, I would just stay with whatever meditation practice the person is using and um, just invite the energy to do what it needs to do to support your awakening. You know, you don't have to force anything. Um, you can tune into it. Often energy will follow attention. I often tell people if they've had an opening and uh, there's some part of their body that's uncomfortable. Most often it's in the head. A lot of times people, particularly who do third eye meditations, get tremendous amount of difficult energy in their heads. But if they the will bring and their, stuff. Yeah. And if you'll bring your attention, just focus on it and bring it down through the neck, into the heart or into the belly, somewhere else in the body, usually the energy will follow attention. Mm. So... That's a, another possibility. But frankly, I wouldn't really try particularly to open the lower chakras um, in, that, in a situation like this where you've already felt sort of a heart opening and a, a chest opening. I would just trust that if it needs to have more activity there, it will. And um, by focusing there is more likely to bring energy into more um, problematic experiences. Yeah. It's, it's much better to bring it up into the heart. That's an important transition from the center of the body into the heart and the, and the upper chakras. I would make a comment and we'll see what you think of this. And, and that is that, as you were saying earlier, the, the Kundalini has its own intelligence. And, you know, we can direct our attention here and there to a certain extent, but to, to, uh, at the same time, it's going to run its course as it sees fit. And we don't want to be too manipulative and, and you know, pushing it this way and that. I mean, it, it's we should just kind of be innocent and let it do its thing, wouldn't you say? Um, yes. I, I mean, I think there's things you can do to balance it if there's discomfort. Right. But um, the more you get into kind of a intuitive relationship with it and ask it what it what it wants to do, what it is doing, where it's going, and just kind of follow it. Uh, the more relaxed you can be about the whole process. Yeah. It's not about using the will to force it into certain patterns. Right. At least not if you're about spiritual awakening. <laughs> if you're about if you're about martial arts or power or something like that, that's where you see the more willful mm. forms of uh, of manipulating energy. I think another thing that's important since we're talking about all these experiences and you know that people have had is not to compare yourself to others too much. You know, because it's going to be different for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, like the second questioner said, well, hey, that's, this thing happened to the first questioner. Why didn't it happen <laughs> that way for me? You know, so, right. I mean, you know, different strokes for different folks. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there, there could be a myriad of reasons. When I 
when I work with somebody, uh, when somebody contacts me for a consultation, I send them a questionnaire and I, I try to get a lot of background information because it really helps me to have more clarity about uh, what they're doing and why they might be having the particular phenomena they are and who they are and what their, their lifestyle is and their background. Because I can see a lot of why there might be a certain reactive experience mm -hmm. based on a certain prior experience. Because um, everybody does come through this process so different yeah. from each other. Yeah. <clears throat> In fact, as you said earlier, some people may go all the way to awakening without having had much of anything that they could identify as kundalini. The whole thing is so subtle, it just doesn't make a big, there's mm -hmm. no big deal about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just reading some things in your book here. There's a nice chapter about grace here. You want to talk about grace a little bit? Well, I'm, I'm going to steal another phrase from Ajashanti, which mm -hmm. he talks about becoming grace prone. <laughs> nice. we, we can't force grace. Grace is, is those moments when something happens that we are appreciative of that we didn't expect, mm -hmm. that we didn't know it could even happen. It just sort of descends upon us, um, and that can be true in many areas of life, that you feel graced. Um, but I think the, the, most, the way that we come most vulnerable to it is, is by the authenticity and the sincerity of our longing to know what's true, and our willingness to be open to however it appears. It may not appear in any way, shape, or form, the way somebody else has told us it ought to. And um, it, it's sort of like letting go of all your beliefs, all your ideas about it, about what it would mean, and just saying, I'm willing to experience uh, whatever the universe wants to hand me um, that I'm ready for at this moment. And, and that doesn't mean you'll ever get an exact response. It, uh, it just is a, sort of an attitude that makes you more available um, as you move through your practices and your life. Um, and not to have any expectation about what it would look like. Yeah. And I think underlying that attitude is the understanding or the attitude or the feeling that there's a kind of a larger intelligence at play than, than we're capable of appreciating. And we just kind of need to... And, and it has our best interests in mind, and we just need to kind of cooperate with it. I agree, yeah. yeah. There's another question that came in. I think we've kind of covered this, but perhaps we haven't covered it adequately, or this question wouldn't have come in. And that is that, is it possible to have a full awakening without having a kundalini awakening? What's the difference between a kundalini awakening and a regular awakening, if, if there's any difference whatsoever? Well, again, I think that... I think that I would define awakening uh, of consciousness as being uh, a complete shift out of your normal way of seeing things and falling into this aware conscious wakes up. You don't really wake up, your consciousness wakes itself up. It, it's like it recognizes or remembers, oh, wait a minute, I'm not this little separate person in here. I'm, I'm some miraculous way part of everything. And, and that can happen in different ways. But that, that, and it leaves your change. It changes you. It, it has a huge impact on you. More than likely, if you have happened to be walking down, the, like a friend of mine was just walking down the street one day, and it was like the world just dissolved, and she just saw that. So she had no reason for that. It just happened to her. I think that uh, that can happen. Yeah. But um, usually, almost always there will be some energetic phenomena that will start turning up a little bit later because that's not the end of spiritual awakening. It's kind of the initiating of it. And everything that isn't yet awake is going to come up for you to see through it or, or um, let it go or um, transform or whatever you want to call it. So very often energies will start arising as soon as that's happened, uh, that you'll start noticing energies arising. Um, a kundalini awakening, as we talked about earlier, you can activate it and you can have it churning around in your stomach for the rest of your life and it never goes into a realization process. Mm -hmm. You're just dealing with energies. Or it can go into the throat and you become very expressive and, and uh, 
or in the heart, you become very loving, but you don't get the, the wisdom aspect. There's both a, a love aspect or, and a wisdom aspect to it. It has to awaken the, you have to awaken the heart and the mind. And in Buddhism, they say the gut for everything to be finished in a way. I don't think it ever really finishes, but yeah. for, for it to feel complete so that you're no longer, there's no interest anymore in searching for anything. Hmm. And, um, and so a lot of times people have partial awakenings. They be, they're very, very loving. Um, they're very in tune with, with everybody, and, and they're really beautiful people. But maybe they haven't had a full kundalini arising. That's an interesting point. I mean, would you say, for instance, that great orators or opera singers or something might have a an awakened throat chakra or um, yeah. you know great scientists might have an awakened intellect chakra whichever one that is uh, or you know great humanitarians that might have an awakened heart chakra and they don't even think of it in those terms or know that but they just happen to be enlivened in those particular chakras and and I think what you're just saying is that let's not leave it at any one chakra let's let's uh, you know, awaken mm -hmm. the, awaken them all I would agree I, that sounds like a great way of looking at it um, I think a lot of people do get, I don't know, I don't quite want to call it intellectual awakening, but um, it's more of a, it's the realization of truth. It's like, uh, it's, I think, quite, quite common that that's how it appears in a Zen practitioner, for example, and uh, that they see the truth. They really see it. But it can lead to kind of a distancing from life, like I... I don't really need to be involved in any of this because I can, I can see it's all irrelevant and I'm not engaged anymore, mm. and um, and it can that can feel good. It can feel satisfying for a while, um, but I think that what has to happen ultimately is that awakeness comes down into the heart chakra, so that one can then lean into life and be willing to be human too, and. Uh, and I think that many traditions have not um, talked about that much yeah. uh, because the effort is so much on you need the realization. Right. You know, you got to let go of you before you're going to have the realization. So if you start talking about, you know, being a good person, opening the heart and all that, it gets reinterpreted by the mind in a different way than when actually the heart actually opens. Mm. And then that has not much to do with your decision to be loving it's it just happens when it needs to happen it's just there did you see the recording of the talk that Adyashanti and Francis Bennett gave in Berkeley about a month ago a few weeks ago um, I didn't see that but I saw the uh, discussion that you did didn't yeah. you do something yeah with I did one at Adyashanti's house yeah, last October that. and we're going to do another one this October but they gave yeah. one they did one in Berkeley a few weeks ago that was kind of on this point and Adi was even saying that you know some years ago, if he started talking about, you know, in embodiment and becoming a better person and integrating it into your humanity and all that stuff, people didn't want to hear it. They said, we just want the realization. Don't give us all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, but these days, there's kind of a shift in the whole spiritual community, Adi was saying, that, and Francis both, that, that seems to be moving in the direction of people realizing the necessity for the integration and the full embodiment um, that, you, that you were just referring to, that you... You know, you're not just impersonal, abstract, absolute being. You are also, you know, Bonnie or Rick, or you're you're a person. You have a life. You know, and, and somehow you have to integrate the two. You know, uh, one of the things, one way that Aja has put it is that uh, when awakening moves through the heart, it becomes love. Mm. And so there's awakening as as uh, wisdom and seeing seeing the truth. But it, 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 it moves, has to move through the heart. And when, it's, when that same sensation is moving through the heart, that's what you feel is love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's, that's a good way of, of looking at it. Because I mean, really, truly, that's what the world needs. I mean, it needs people to, to be not uh, so free, so empty, that they don't uh, engage. Right. And, and then I think the West, particularly, we... We're not, it's not about escape. In fact, if you're only awake when you're out of everything else, uh, you're only half awake. If you can't be happy being human too, you're really only half awake. You're not free. You're only half free right. because you can't prefer one to the other and be free. Yeah. 
you remember the ox herding pictures, there's one in which is just pure awareness, but there's the, the final one is the guy riding into town on his donkey or whatever, happy, happy and, you know, mm -hmm. spreading the joy. So, um, anyway, so your books are the kind of books that, you know, I, I sort of felt as I read them, I, th I, I felt like, wow, I wish we could just kind of do an interview where we just read this whole book and, and then keep, keep stopping and discussing various points, but obviously that wouldn't be practical. So, uh, you know, I, I, rec I would recommend these, these books and I'll link to them from, from your page on my site. Um, and I think most people will enjoy them. But before uh, we conclude, is there any, anything that, you know, we haven't covered that you want to make sure to get into the, this discussion be, before we conclude? I just uh, I want to reiterate, I guess, that, that the most important thing is really not finding a way to activate Kundalini no matter what. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is if what you want is freedom uh, from yourself, basically, is what you get is freedom from yourself, is um, a very sincere and open-hearted spiritual uh, practice, meditation, or being in the world from the heart, uh, and that your energies may arise and, and you can embrace that too. It's kind of an embracing of everything that is. Um, and anybody that's, that's gone through that far enough feels only uh, in, incredible gratitude for it. So if there's fear, you need to find a way to bless the part of you that's fearful, but um, invite the part of you that is the longing. I love that Ramana points this out, that which is longing uh, from the heart is that which is already awake. It's like follow your longing to the source in the uh, heart. Actually, he says to the right side of the heart, to mm -hmm. the uh, chakra, a small chakra that's on that side of the heart. That's the source of the I thought. Mm -hmm. That's the source of the longing, the longing for truth. So there's a part of you that already knows it, already wants it. So that's what you, you're just trying to get in touch with that and then let the energy do what it will. Nice. It'll do what it needs to do. Great. And my books, are, my books are for people in this process. They're self-help books for people to carry them through the process. Mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope they work that way for people. And then you do the consultations over Skype and everything. May I ask how much you charge for those consultations? Well, uh, generally, I charge $100 for, uh, well, it takes me two or three hours because I do the questionnaire and then I mm -hmm. talk with them. But um, I never pursue anybody for money. So right. if, they, if, they, that, if they can afford it, that's good. If not, that's fine, too. And, um, well, that's also extremely I, reasonable if, it's, if it takes you two or three hours and you charge $100. It's, it's a bargain. Yeah, well, I, I'm not going to make a lot of money in this right. process, and I don't need to. Yeah. Uh, also, once in a while, I do programs. Um, in fact, I'm trying, going to try to set up something on the web that I can do in a more consistent way. Mm -hmm. But I also do uh, workshops here in Ashland, Oregon, once in a while, at least once a year, for people in this process. And uh, so I'm generally available, try to be available. Um, Great. Well, I'll, I'll be linking to your website, and I imagine you have some kind of email sign-up thing there so people can be notified when you have an event, right, that kind of thing. Yeah, I have calendars on both of my websites, and people can uh, contact me through, through the websites. And that's kundaliniguide.com and awakeningguide.com. Great. And I'll link to those and to your books. Um, great. So thanks, Bonnie. This has really been enjoyable. I've loved it. It's great to meet you. I appreciate the work you do to expose people to so many different uh, perspectives of spirituality. I think it's very valuable today. Well, I love doing it. Uh, I've always loved connecting people. Even when I was in high school, I liked giving people rides home, you know, because it's just fun yeah. to sort of connect people with what they needed. Um, but let me just, uh, let me make some concluding remarks. Um, I've been speaking with Bonnie Greenwell, as you know, and this is an ongoing series of interviews as you probably also know and to see um you know the whole archive of all the older ones go back to go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews um, menu item where you'll see them categorized in four or five different ways 
Um, and uh, there's also a future interviews menu. And if you've been watching this and wondering how it is that people are sending in questions, the, the way to do that is go into the future interviews menu and you'll see a link to the live feed of each interview that's being done over Skype. And if you tune in while we're doing it, and the times are given there, then um, there's a form at the bottom of that um, future interviews page where you can put in a question and it'll, it'll come to me. <clears throat> there's a donate button, as I mentioned at the beginning, which we depend and rely upon people clicking if they feel so motivated in order to uh, enable to us to put as much time into this as we do. Um, there's an email newsletter sign-up thing, so you can be notified each time a new interview is posted. You can also subscribe to the, new, to the YouTube channel, and I think YouTube will notify you when a new one is posted. And this also exists as an audio podcast, so there's a page on backapp.com where you can sign up for that through iTunes or you know, various other um, podcasting services that work on different devices. So thanks for listening or watching. The next couple of weeks are going to be, people have sometimes said, well, you know, uh, you started out just interviews with ordinary people, and then it seems like you're interviewing all these teachers who are selling books and all this stuff. So we thought we'd just take a couple of weeks and interview a couple of ordinary people who just we happen to you know, get in touch with or got in touch with us, one of whom had no interest in spirituality whatsoever, kind of like the kind of people Bonnie was talking about earlier, and things started happening. So we thought it might be interesting to talk to him, and maybe some people can relate to that. So that's what we'll be doing. So thanks for listening or watching. Um, thank you again, Bonnie. And thank uh, you. yeah, we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>